Morning, friends. It is seed start and Saturday. And here we are on this beautiful, at least here in southeastern Virginia, it is a really beautiful autumn morning. I mean, what do you call it? Autumn or fall? There's a thought. Um, so today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, but before we jump into that, I want to welcome everybody here. If you're new here, um, my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler with the Gardener's Workshop. And today we are doing a Q&A on cool flowers. And that means you need to start posting your questions. I know that y'all have them because our inbox and social media is piled high with them. So I didn't really want to start seeds here this morning and I thought this will be a great opportunity for us to talk about cool flowers and all that is related to that. So bring them on, whether you're talking about direct seeding, transplants, is it too late? How do I prepare? Whatever you got, bring it on and good morning to everyone. Um, so as I was saying just a minute ago, if you're new here, um, this broadcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, where we just have so many resources, y'all. So many resources. You can literally fall into our website and not come out for probably a month. We have tons of videos, blogs. We have two podcasts now, Field and Garden, as well as her sister podcast, The Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. And we just, there, our online garden shop is over there, as well as all of our online courses. So every level of education, whether you're a home gardener or a wannabe um, flower farmer or somebody that wants to build a business on locally grown flowers, we have a lot of information on that too. So y'all, sorry, I'm kind of, I have a different chair down here today. Well, it's really good. It's just a little different. Um, so as I was contemplating my cool flower garden this morning. Um, we're kind of, we never really wrap up. We just kind of constantly keep adding to our cool flowers. As I realize I missed something or, um, you know, a seed didn't get started or we perhaps um, learn about a new seed or a new color. Um, and if you guys are just joining us, this morning is all about a Q&A for cool flowers. So please post your questions so I have something to talk about, right? So post your questions, y'all. Um, and so we're just, because I am in southeastern Virginia, which is zone, winter hardiness zone 7B slash 8A, I literally live on the line. And it just depends on how the wind blows, literally, right? So as long as my ground is not frozen and the beds are prepared, we can continue planting right through winter, right? So, you know, here's the thing about that. That is one of the, I think, greatest gifts that I have manipulated out of using um, mulch and Bio 360 film. We make a bunch of beds, more than we think we're going to use for cool flowers because we always end up filling them up. So that means that even when we plant our planted, planned transplants, then there's always a bed or so left over. So as I come across additional seeds that I want to start or whatever, we have somewhere to put them because that's the thing that holds people back. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, the, the lower half of the United States anyway, from the that Mason-Dixon line, which is like Maryland, which is, you know, mid-Atlantic, over across the country, um, most of us, our ground does not actually freeze. So if you have um, a few extra pieces of equipment, such as if you have a row cover and you have hoops, that means if your ground is not frozen and you've prepared your beds, you have the option to literally continue to plant through the winter, um, right through the winter. And, you know, we then restart planting normally anyway in, ve in very early spring, which is like early February for us. So we kind of are in tune to having those tools on hand. So we are continuing to start. In fact, we have some, um, Sweet William and Feverfew and something else. Oh, the annual baby's breath. 
um, that are all about this tall over in my grow room um, that we just needed more of them. I, I'm working on a project and we didn't quite have enough volume that I felt like I needed for images in the spring. So I said, well, let's just go ahead and, and start it now. And I actually have another seed order. We always have seed orders. Our seed, because of the warehouse and the seed supply there, I now actually order a lot of my seeds separately here for the farm just because it's kind of a confusing operation to do it otherwise. So I have a little seed order on the way that nobody really knows about, um, except I did mention it to Bobo. Um, so Bobo will get them started when they get here. Um, so the number one question that I am getting at this time of the year is, nobody can guess? All right. Is it too late for me to plant cool flowers? And friends, that so depends on where you are and your conditions. I will say that, so the cool flower concept is this, for you to fall plant any cool season hardy annuals that are winter hardy in your winter hardiness zone at the best time is to do, or the optimal time is to do that six to eight weeks before your first fall frost, because that allows your transplant or your seed that you're direct sowing, depending on which that particular seed's preference is, that gives them six to eight weeks to either sprout and grow into little plants or for your transplant to get um, established. Now, as I just mentioned, we are just continuing to plant throughout winter oftentimes. But if you noticed, I was talking about transplanting, not direct seeding. Direct seeding does um, have not quite as much wiggle room as transplants do because of this. Seeds, even cool season hardy annuals need warm season, um, need warm, sorry, warm temperatures to actually sprout. They need the heat of the days with the cool nights, not cold, cold nights, but cool nights to actually, for the seed to break dormancy and actually sprout. So that means that if you've already missed, let's just say you live in zone five where you're already like had your first frost, you know, you're already cold. Well, you probably have missed your window for direct seeding outdoors. Even using hoops and row covers to help concentrate what heat and sunshine you're getting, that is definitely a struggle. Um, so I would say to you that the best cool flowers to push the envelope on are those that can be transplanted so that you can start them indoors where you control the conditions to get the seeds sprout and into a little plant and then you can transplant them out to the garden. Um, and the biggest takeaway, and I do see we have some questions now. Um, I'll get to, let me just finish this thought and then I'll start answering questions. Um, so the biggest takeaway here is, first off, if you still haven't planted cool flowers or you want to plant more cool flowers, then you need to get your plants, um, your beds prepared. That's the number one problem, friends, because the worst thing you can do to your garden is to work wet soil. If you pick up a handful and squish it together and drop it and it doesn't just totally break apart and crumble up, it's too wet. And working wet soil destroys soil structure that you will never recover. I mean, it's not like, oh, I'll make it better in the spring. It's not going to happen. You're making dirt clods and it takes decades for that to get undone. So you do not want to work wet soil and it's already too late for you, then you just need to say, you know what, I'm getting my calendar mark for next year. I'm not letting this happen to me again. Um, it is not worth working wet soil. Um, that's perhaps one of the biggest benefits of no-till. A lot of times those plant um, beds are raised. They aren't nearly as wet. You can just plant in them. They're already raised, um, hopefully weed-free. So the takeaway is the first thing you need to do if you're thinking, you know what, I want to plant some more cool flowers and my soil is probably not too wet is to go out and get your beds ready immediately. You have all the time in the world to start the seed if your ground's not going to freeze. Then get your seed started and then get on 
if you need them, get hoops and row covers so you can actually heat that little space up just a little bit more. Um, so let's see what kind of questions we have here. All right. Andrea. Ah, is in Cheshire, England. Hello, England. We're beekeepers and flower growers. I have become allergic to bees. Me too. I am highly allergic. So haven't been able to grow any flowers this year. I have lots of seeds and want to know what I can start off now. I'm looking at turning to dried flowers as I did about 30 years ago. Just watched Ellen's video and loved it. Oh my gosh. Y'all, That thank you for that reminder, Andrea. If you guys have not seen the webinar that we're offering right now, it's Ellen Frost's dried wreath making tips. You've got to get it. It's a free webinar. The um, link, I'm sure Jesse's going to put it on the feed here, but it's also, if you're watching this after the fact, it's actually in my Instagram feed. You can get it there or in the profile. Um, so if you're allergic to bees, you know, I mean, all flowers attract bees. Um, and so you're in England, you're on the same, I'm just trying to think what your season is. So you're basically, the season is pretty much the same as us. You're on the same um, latitude, is that what it's called? You're in the same season as us. So cool season, hardy annuals are what you want to look at. And um, in the book, it talks about cool flowers, the book. Um, it tells you what zone most much of England is zone equivalent to the U.S.'s zone six, seven. Um, and so a lot of that book, you can actually fall plant, which means there'll be some of your earliest fall bloomers. And if you watched Ellen's, and I just did a podcast with Ellen that won't be coming out. It's on Seed Talk. We, Lane and I did it with her. It won't be out for, I think, another, I think it comes out next week. One of the things that she talked about that I follow and see all this stuff behind me is dried except for this bucket of zinnias right here. We don't grow stuff specifically for drying. We just dry all of our leftovers. That's what all this is, y'all. This is stuff that would have gone to the compost. It's a, my winter wall of wonder. And so I would say to you, if you have specific varieties, go for it. But any cool season hardy annual you can actually plant now, you know, stuff like larkspur and um, poppies and um, status. And I'm just looking at my wall. Um, I mean, there's just in some of the rude Becky is not all of them bloom so well. Um, but a lot of those cool flowers, you can actually um, get back on cool dry flowers are back in y'all. Um, you know, and the straw flowers, which we actually plant them in very early spring, um, you know, all of them attract bees, though. So if you're trying to stay away from bees, I'm not sure how you can actually do that. Um, and so I hope that helps at all. But cool season hardy annuals are what you want to be planting now, Andrea. All right. So here is Becky. I'm in a new house and wanting to plant on the five foot deep bank, I'm deliriously digging up grass and weeds. Is it a hundred percent necessary to get them up? So here, you know, y'all, I'm sorry. I can't give you like such straightforward answers. It 100% depends Becky on what it is you've got. If you have perennial weeds and grass, which is Bermuda grass, a lot of the wire grass, there are so many different nut grass, there are so many different weeds that are perennial. And what that means, unfortunately, sit down, Becky. What that means is the more you dig it and pull it, you're like pruning it. You're like cutting it like a cut flower. You're making more shoots come. So the very first thing I would say to you, Becky, is you need to find out what you have. And that's what your local extension office is there for. You can take close up pictures and send it to them take some samples and go down there and say, this is what I've got growing in a spot I want to kill. What do I do? Or, and it's not the right time of the year, you can smother. Um, so what I would probably do in your instance, because I know you want to get something going as soon as you can, because we're now in winter, assuming that you're in the United States, um, smothering really, there's no heat to like cook anything under it. So you just need to out compete and you're not really going to be able to plant in this area for the winter, but you can help get a hold on it for next spring. I would put down, I would cut it down as low to the ground as you can, whatever's left there. 
and then I would put cardboard and then I would put a lot of mulch on top of it. You can even put a little compost on top of the cardboard. What you're strictly going to do is out compete that area for spring. Um, and then maybe in the spring you can plant in it. But the problem is with those perennial weeds and grasses, no matter what you do, unless you use a specific herbicide to kill them, and you can't do that in cold weather, most of them need heat to work. You just need to, to kind of grab the ground that you have gathered. And I am just so sorry about that. There's not better news. Um, so the, the method is either smothering, using chemicals or tillage. Um, and so, so very sorry about that. Keep us posted on how that goes. Paulette, maybe I just don't get it. I can't picture this. If I were to direct seed in my zone, 5B, prepared beds now, hoop with covers. What are my little seeds going to experience and look like? Well, first off, Paulette, um, I would guess it's all, your, your zone only tells you what is winter hardy in your zone or not. Um, there's not very much winter hardy for zone five. I mean, somebody in zone seven or eight has a lot more to choose from. The big benefit to people in more northern regions like you in zone five is very early spring planting. But to answer your question, um, so if there is something to direct seed in your zone five garden, those things should have been direct seeded six to eight weeks before your first um, fall frost. That's why I was saying earlier that, you know, you, there's really not a lot of option to direct seed late. Um, there's just not enough heat out there. And I think you were the one that said I was answering your question. I'm thinking that's what you were talking about. Um, in your zone five garden, if your beds are already prepared and your ground's not frozen, which I would guess it's not yet, um, you could still transplant with hoop and row covers. Using hoops and row covers, particularly if you put black bio 360 or black plastic mulch down, when you have a black surface and you use hoops and row covers, it doesn't help a ton, but blocking that wind with those row covers just intensifies the sunshine. And that just helps the soil to not get as cold for the plants to get rooted in, which is all we're hoping for over winter. That's the big benefit of the fall planted stuff over stuff that's planted later. Andy, good morning. Did you say not to soak sweet pea seeds? And please say again, which seeds you just put on the heat mat for only 24 hours? Um, sure thing. So yes, after, I mean, in, I think actually in Cool Flowers, it recommends soaking the sweet pea seeds. What we have really learned about sweet pea seeds is some of the varieties that are imported into the United States, and this is deeper than we should go, but we're going to go there. Some of the bulk seeds that are imported actually go through um, a radiation process to kill anything that's living on them, and that kills the vitality of some of the seeds. That's what I've been told by a sweet pea grower in England, a very well-known big sweet pea grower. So he recommends, and Farmer Bailey, who actually grows sweet pea seeds and sells them, said that mo that sweet peas should not need to be soaked. I believe that so some of the varieties that I had been trying to grow that didn't have the greatest germination did have better germination with soaking. But sweet pea seeds that we started this year, and I did not soak any of them, and I started some American grown seeds, some imported seeds, and I will tell you that they all started excellently with not soaking and no heat mat. They actually sat outside on my carport in about 55 to 60 degree weather and we had excellent germination. I think in our efforts to help jumpstart some of these that just didn't have great germination, we started soaking them and felt like it worked. Um, so that is a recant from Cool Flowers that we no longer soak sweet pea seeds um, and we do not soak them and we do not put them on the heat mat. And so those seeds that I put on the heat mat for like a 24 to 36 hour period with great germination um, is Ami Magus and Daucus. 
Um, and you can uh, you can try that with Dill and Bells of Ireland. I haven't had great success, but they fall into that kind of same category. They need the heat to warm them up, to break dormancy, but then they want cool conditions to actually sprout and grow on. Um, so hope that helps. Oh, so Paulette, I think you were referring to the direct seeding business. So I'm glad that worked out for you. Gretchen, after my cool flea flower seeds sprout, they never get four to six inches tall. I follow the suggested watering and fish emulsion schedule. My room is usually warmer than 60 degrees. Could that be the reason? Yes. So, you know, there's a real fine line of, um, figuring out what the temperature needs to be. And that's one reason sometimes it's best to have our seedling heat mats in a different location from our grow lights because the temperatures sometimes need to be so different. Um, so if you're watering every morning, as I say, you should water every 24 hours. The big question I have is, are your blocks dry? If they are not dry, then the room temperature is too cool where they are. You want your blocks to go from moist in the morning when you water to dry to the next morning. And that's when you should be watering is in the morning. So while the lights are on and the room is at its warmest because the lights are on, um, the, the, the blocks are drying out and the next, then they go through the night kind of dry and the next morning you water them again. That's how you prevent junk from growing on your blocks. Um, and that's also which helps, um, them to grow faster. If your blocks are staying wet all the time or just a little wet all the time, they will not be vigorous. And that could be it. So that's the big question, Gretchen. Are your blocks dry when you go to water in the morning? All right. So, and Jesse did put this opt-in here. You can request Ellen's video on dried reefs. I mean, it's so very, very good. Then you need to go over to your podcast app and you need to subscribe to Field and Garden, which is my podcast. And then our sister podcast is Seed Talk with me and Lane and a podcast that's coming out in the next 10 to 14 days of Ellen. Um, we're talking about a lot of this dried flower stuff. So you need to check that out too. Andrea, fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. So lovely to speak with you. What a delight to see your flowers. Oh, thank you so much. Connie, Chicago Zone 5B. Could I drop some cool flower seeds in a pot outside for next spring? You can do that, but I don't know when they're going to germinate. I mean, Chicago is cold. I've been there in the winter. Um, so when you would plant for Chicago, most stuff stuff is six to eight weeks before your first your last spring frost. So yes, you can do that, but you need to do it. Um, I would actually say that you ought to sow those seeds indoors in those pots, have them in warm conditions as they sprout, then you can start moving them outside. Um, so you can have them in very early spring, but they um, are not going to do anything all winter, but sit out there and freeze. And I would say, why even bother? Blinded by the light, what have you got to say this morning? Almost missed the lab. Oh, here we go. Glad you're here. I'm in zone 8B, direct seeding, now cool flower, seed starting Lysianthus. Good for you. So I'm glad you said that. So my direct seeded stuff was done. I'm looking on the calendar. Two weeks ago. And they're all about this tall. I'm really happy. I only have a cup. We really had some varmint disruption. I mean, I have 400 foot beds and each bed has three rows in it. I have a couple of spots that didn't have great germination or they could just be slow, but I have had, there's one area that you can just tell the squirrels. I just, I need a, I could just, a, I want to just thump them. That's what I'm going to say. Um, that they really got in there and messed around and there's no germination and I'll just have to figure out what I'm going to do about that. Um, but 8B is a little bit, I'm 8A is warmer than us. So it's perfect timing. And yes, if you are starting Lysianthus seeds for very early spring planting, which is for me, I would be planting mid February. Um, yes, it's definitely time. You know, we have kind of a rule in the cut flower world. Um, if you, you don't eat Thanksgiving dinner until you've ordered your Lysianthus plugs 
or started your seed. So yes, it is definitely time to get your seed started. I'm okay to seed start Lizzie Anthus now and plan out in a few weeks. Yes, Lizzie Anthus is actually winter hardy. We say zone seven, but I know it's winter hardy, colder than that, like zone six, but there's really no um, documentation of that. So people that live like me and you in zone eight, as long as the ground isn't frozen and you have a place to put them, but it takes a Lysianthus 12 weeks for the plant part of it to get this big. That's why most people buy plugs. So good luck to you. Patricia, isn't feverfew a perennial? Does it need to be replanted every year? That's a great question, Patrice, Patricia. Um, and it really depends on where you live and what variety you're talking about. Um, there are some, let's see, there's some varieties of feverfew that um, can be what we call half hardy perennials. That means that they definitely will survive winter um, in your zone but they don't have a reputation of being long-lived perennials. Meaning, let's just take for granted an, an instance, another example is Rudbeckias. Um, there are some of the Rudbeckias that the study that NC State did on them is that 25% of the hardy annual varieties of Rudbeckia, because there are some specific perennial Rudbeckias, like Goldstrom is a perennial, um, all the others, like the ones, all the ones we grow are hardy annuals. They did a study and 25% of the Indian summer Rudbeckia, that is a half, that is a hardy annual, 25% of them will survive another year. Meaning that they give people the illusion that they're perennials, but they're not really. You as a gardener, maybe, but as a grower, you cannot rely on a crop that only 25% at the most may come back next year. So that's why we just rip it out and replant it every year. Because if you've tried to rely on it, you're going to have beds with 75% holes and spotty plants. I mean, I really had a hard time figuring all this out when I became a flower farmer. It's like, oh my gosh, why would they rip out that beautiful plant instead of, you know, planting around it? Y'all, there are so many problems and intense labor that all creates. You get a far better crop by replanting it every year. And fever few is just like that. Fever few, just like Rudbeckia, will reseed. Some of the plants seldom will survive but sometimes they do and make us believe that they're a perennial. You are just better. That is my rule. If it's in my big working garden, it gets ripped out and replanted every year. Yarrow is another one. There are perennial yarrows. There's hat, then there's hardy annual yarrows. I only grow the half, um, hardy annuals. Car, um, Colorado sunset. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm thinking about too much. Colorado sunset. Um, is if you leave it to just reseed itself, which is what a lot of people do, within two to three years, you have pretty much all pale pink and white. You lose all those killer colors that we planted it for in the beginning. And it's so easy to lose focus on that. So um, that's why Fever Few, Rudbeckia, the um, Yarrows, um, I'm trying to think what else. There's so many of these. A lot of the cool flowers fall under this. It's like, yes, they'll reseed, but you as a home gardener, for sure, dabble all you want. But the day you start with a bottom line, meaning a business, you can no longer do that kind of gambling, right? So, sorry, I went down a rabbit hole there. All right, here's a question from Connie. Succession planning for next year. What cool season flowers would bloom in spring and don't like heat so that I could replace them with tender annuals? Well, Connie, that is the million dollar question. And it doesn't really matter what zone you're in. It's all about, again, your first and last frost, your last frost, but also what kind of conditions you have. You know, when people live, let's say, in New England, where they grow hydrangeas out in full blown sun um, and they bloom beautifully all summer, those of us in the South look at them and say, oh my gosh, ours would burn up like that. It really depends on your conditions. That's why planting your cool flowers or all doing your succession planting 
either by the bed, if it's a small garden, or by a block of bled, beds. I always have like, if I, if I was doing an acre or whatever, let's just say an acre, I would probably have an acre broken into four blocks of beds. One block would be cool season hardy annuals, whether it's fall planted in very early spring. The next block would be where I would plant my first warm season tender annuals. And I know that that block is right there and that's where I'm going to plant my first recipe of warm season tender annuals, which is what you're talking about. Then when my when we get to next year, the third area and the fourth block of my big acre probably have cover crops in them right now because I don't need them early in the spring. That third block is where my second recipe will come. Well, when the fourth block comes over here, when we get to June or July, a lot of my cool flowers are finishing up. I never know. I wrote the book and I still don't know for sure when my cool flowers are going to be done because it definitely depends on the kind of weather we're having. Is it rainy? Is it cool? Is it, I mean, some years we are already 95 degrees by the end of April in the afternoons. Other years I am begging for 90 by the end of May. It totally depends on your condition. So you can't rely on when your cool season annuals are going to be done to plan your first and even your second warm season tender annuals. You have to have designated spots for them. So what I normally do is I have those, what I just told you, and you know, then we plant tons of sunflowers, right? Every single week. That's where, where I start filling in my cool flower beds. So I, I, in those first two blocks of warm season stuff, I have designated sunflower space because, I mean, we have to have space for them, right? But by the time we get about into that second block, when we're planting sunflowers every week, literally that's what I typically use in my cool flower beds. It's like all of a sudden, all the um, nigella and the poppies and all that, man, not the, not the poppy pods, but the Iceland poppies are all coming out. And I can start putting weekly successions of sunflowers in there. So I hope that helps you. My book, Vegetables Love Flowers, really addresses the whole succession planting thing. Because, you know, that book is really about a three season cutting garden. If, if you need more information, that would really probably maybe help you more. Fran, question on irrigation for three foot wide beds. How many rows of drip tape should I plan on using? Fran, I'll, I'll tell you, um, there is no one answer for everybody. That, one, that totally depends on the type of soil that you have, whether it's clay or sand. Um, the way that I determined is I spoke to my irrigation people. I mean, everybody, I mean, it sounds to me like you're a, a, either a commercial grower or heading that way. You need to have relationships with whoever your suppliers are. Our suppliers um, on the East Coast is Berry Hill Irrigation. On the West Coast, it's Dripworks. Both of them sell the same type of stuff. But, and this is the time of year to talk to them, to get your plan of what you have, and they need that they, they tell you on their website the information that you need to know, like how much water pressure you have and volume and come up with your plan. And then they're happy to help you figure that out. They really are the ones to tell you that I don't figure that out for myself. Even I rely on my irrigation people to help me. So that's what I would definitely do. But it, that a lot of that depends on um, the pressure you have, the volume and the type of soil you have. So. That would be um, kind of where you would find that out. Paulette, we learn a ton from you going down the rabbit hole. Thank you for sharing your experience and opinion. Hey, and it's that's so fun. I try really, really, I mean, I am so ADHD. On top of being dyslexic and learning disabled, I have ADHD. And it um, doesn't take much for me to go left and never come back. So thank you, Paulette, for, for affirming my rabbit holes. So Chris asks, hi, so happy I finally caught a live question. What perennials do you keep in the ground for popular cut flowers? Well, Chris, here's the news flash. I literally only grow peonies as a perennial. Everything else I grow is 100% 
annuals, warm season and tender, um, warm season tenders and cool season hardy annuals because I have small space. I am a farmer in the middle of the city. My entire property is a little less than three acres. My working cutting garden when we were in full production was never more than an acre and a half. Um, and of that, just to give you all a picture, a snapshot of that acre and a half cutting garden, typically we were cutting, harvesting from a third of it at any given time. So let's just say it's June and um, we're harvesting from a third, uh, basically a half an acre. And the, the another half an acre might be in cover crop and another half an acre might be just being planted or unplanted or so forth and so on. So that means that we're moving through the farm constantly. And so to get the biggest bang for my square footage for the bucks, you definitely grow annuals um, because they bloom for a much longer period of time. You get a lot more abundance. So during that time when we were in high production for that acre and a half, um, we were producing 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week. Think about that for a minute. That is a lot of blooming flowers. And all those flowers had to be started, planted, maintained, harvested, bunched, sold, delivered, the whole nine yards. And we did all that from an acre and a half. Um, and that's why people don't. And then that's because we didn't grow a lot of perennials. Perennials maintain real estate year round. They have to be maintained. People think that, oh, we just plant them once. I find I find perennials far more labor intensive than our annuals are when you weigh the value of how much per square foot you're making. Perennials, we battle a lot of perennial weeds here, meaning like nutgrass and Bermuda grass, creeping grasses that are a constant, constant battle. We would have to have people that did nothing but every single day did nothing but keep that stuff from creeping into our perennial beds versus with annuals. Um, they stay in the ground long but not all year round. They bloom for most of their life. We're constantly harvesting from them. Um, so peonies are pretty much the only ones that um, produce enough per stem. Um, and I had them, you know, our peonies produce about a thousand stems a year and they, we didn't buy any of them. They were our grandmothers and a, and a, a cousin's mom's um, so I'm sorry, I can't help you in the perennial department. Dave Dowling's course, Bulbs, Perennials, and Woodies, he has a lot of great tips and ideas in there. But once I went down the rabbit hole of annuals, I found it was low investment, high return. I constantly was able to change up and change our offering. So it made more variety for our customers. Um, it just was a, it was a really, really good decision and worked out really, really well. All right, Alberta. We have so many people in Alberta growing cool flowers. This is Tracy. Last frost date, May 18th, with first frost date in the middle of September. So you've it's already passed. What would you suggest the top five, five flowers for me to plant? Well, Tracy, you can really grow all of them. You're just going to be very early spring planting them, right, as transplants. Um, definitely Rudbeckias and Sweet William, tons of Snapdragons. Um, and also it depends on what is your market. Who are you selling to? Are you selling to commercial people? Um, because those crop, three crops that I just named to you have so many varieties and they are such strong cash crops. Um, and then, of course, straw flowers, which are huge. I'm just looking behind me status. All of them, all the for you in Alberta, because of your short growing season, you want to grow stuff that is really easy to start from transplants, um, to start from seed as transplants so you can get them as big as you can to get them in the ground as early as you can plant. Um, I would say to you that your bed should be prepared in late summer for next year. I know you probably have a ton of snow load, but that means that as soon as your snow starts to melt, you can pull back silage tarps that reveal beds that are prepared and mulched, however you do that, and you can plug in these cold season transplants. I mean, we typically, we of course don't get anywhere near cold from you, but we typically have some snow load um, when it's time for me to plant my very early spring stuff. And because we use Bio360, this is just a tip for anybody else that's in my conditions. Oftentimes, if we'll get a snowstorm 
where we'll have four to eight inches of snow and mid February's coming. It's time for me to plant lisianthus and stock and straw flowers on those sunny afternoons. Um, you know, we can do a lot of things. If it's a really intense sun and I have Bio360, we sometimes can take push brooms and that sunlight is enough to make the snow loose enough that we can just push it off and plant. Or if it's not, if it's the snow's just not melting like we want, we'll put silage tarps on top of the sun, on top of the snow to get the hot sun on the black tarp to melt the snow underneath that's going to reveal the bed. There's all kinds of mess you can do. But up in Alberta, you can still plant cool flowers so much earlier than you can any warm season tender annual. So anything you can do to get those cool season annuals in the ground in very early spring, which is six to eight weeks before your last spring frost, but you probably have snow problems. You need to start scratching your head and thinking, how can I? So you need to get your beds ready in the fall. And so that you just are need a way to reveal them in very early spring to plant stuff. And I would go for all the transplant stuff. Lombata, Feverfew, Rebecca, Snaps, um, Sweet Williams. Lysianthus, of course. Um, I mean, Lysianthus wants to get established in cold soil and then it, it wants to get started in the cold and bloom in the heat. Dave Down and I did a great podcast. I think it's named something about hot to cold or cold to hot or whatever. Um, you can find it on Field and Garden. But anyway, hopefully that helps you. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Jesse. Jesse just reminded me um, the other perennial I grow is hellebores because that's in our shade garden. Um, and that's another really great one. And it's so well worth it. It is a high dollar per stem um, cash crop. All right. Thank you so much. I heard you on Joe Lample's podcast and now I'm hooked. I'm so excited for next year. Thank you so much. And you know what? I was just, I almost brought it out here with me because I wasn't sure what we were going to talk about y'all. I have Joe's new book, um, sitting in on my um, coffee table. And if y'all haven't, I mean, it's the Organic Vegetable Growers. I think that's the name of it. Joe's new book is awesome, is what I want to say to you. And it's a great, um, the Joe Gardner show is what she's talking about. And Joe and I have become really great friends. Um, totally love it. He has an awesome online vegetable course coming out next year. It's awesome. So blinded by the light. Oh, she must be, oh, where'd it go? Can't wait for the November 1st course to begin. So my online school enrolled back in October and um, we start school November 1st. Yeah, I'm stoked too. I'm, um, I am so much, um, it's different now that I'm not in high production. Um, education is definitely my first calling now. And after working my tail off for 25 years farming, um, just have a lot of stuff to say. So that's really awesome tarps over the snow and ice is genius. You know, I mean, but the, the but all of this re revolves around y'all. You've got to prepare your beds in late summer for next year. And we found that when we use the Bio 360 with the black side up, it does not break down over winter. You know, I mean, we make our very early spring planted beds in the fall with the black side up. They go through winter with no plants in them. And we typically just leave them bare out there. But then if it snows and you can't get the snow off, just throw a tarp over it. And yeah, it really, I mean, you can, when you're desperate, as we have been more than once, you'll do anything. And when you have, when you grow in the volume and intensely, as I did, you learn to try stuff because you have, first off, what have you got to lose, right? Secondly, we have so much it's like, all right, if I kill them or I destroy the bed or whatever, oh, well, we got, you know, 38 other beds. When we were in high production there now, the last five to eight years, my blocks, like I was talking earlier, if you broke your acre up into four places, um, I typically would do blocks of beds. The last few years for as we were winding down, I did blocks in 10 to 12 beds. The beds are 100 feet long. 10 to 12 bed blocks. When we were in high production, we had 36 to 40 beds that were 120 feet long in each block. So that meant that I had 40 120 foot long beds of just cool flowers. 
That is a lot of blooming flowers, y'all. When you plant intensely as I do and you cut the heck out of it, you can't believe how many flowers you can produce. Um, you just can't keep up. You just can't keep up. I just did a podcast this morning. I was really led to share. It's like if you aren't able to cut all of your beds clean at every harvest, you either need to hire people or you're growing too much because it just totally undermines the whole cut flower concept when that happens to you. All right, y'all, we're coming down the pike here. Sandy, thank you for all this encouragement. I still have straw flowers blooming oh, in northeastern Indiana. Go, girl, that I had soul blocks blocked. We had an early frost in the beginning of October. They're still giving me flowers. You know, I just checked the two-week um, forecast because we are growing. And I'll tell y'all, I think I've shown y'all um, these specialty, specially hybridized peppers by a grower for cut flowers. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to reach over here and get them. Anyway, we're growing them for seed. And the reason what they were hybridized for is if you've ever grown ornamental, I mean, when we were in high production, I was always looking for new annual crops, right? And peppers were a big part of our business. All our florists would buy them every single week if we had them, if they were very usable. And what wasn't usable was um, peppers that are buried in the foliage. And that meant either the grower had to strip all the foliage to expose the fruits or you would sell the stems really cheap to your florist and their staff would have to strip them. Well, that's a pain in the butt and nobody wanted to do it. So what you want is a pepper that the peppers rise above the foliage so they're super easy to strip. Well, a grower did that and I bought the seeds 10, 15 years ago and we've been growing them ever since. Well, we're growing the seed for production. So it, these are going to be available. So this is a good reason to get on our farm news email because that's where this is going to be announced first when they're available. Anyway, I checked the phone, the weather app this morning to see what's the two week. We still have no frost in sight. So I can leave the crop in the field that's growing the seed. So this is them. They don't look like much right now, but do you know, and these have been, we've let them wilt, but look how all the foliage is below the fruit. That means in a matter of seconds, I could have all the foliage off of these. Do you have any idea how useful this is to a, to a florist? And it gets red, so you can leave them in the field to get them red, or we use the heck out of them when they're green. These are culinary, hotter than heck, peppers, but that's not what we grow them for. Um, so we feel your excitement over the frost not coming yet. Um, but in Indiana, that's pretty amazing, Sandy. I'm so happy you um, share that with us. I have some purple cone flowers. Can I plant them out now? Blinded by the light. I have no idea. I have never grown cone flowers. They are not um, a really high... Um, demand cut flower because they're, and I'll tell you why, they have a beautiful cone, but their petals turn backwards and people think they look like old flowers. So it's just not um, really very, not very in demand. People, you know, that's just, they're beautiful in the garden, but that's about it. And I just dropped pepper foliage everywhere. Hello, I'm in zone 9A. What fall plants would you suggest for me? I mean, you can plant all cool flower, all the cool flowers that are in the book. There are additional cool flowers that have, we've added to our lineup since the book was published. And you can find those if you go to the gardenersworkshop.com, go to the store and then go to seeds. There is a cool season, hardy annual seed category. And there's all the ones that I grow are in there. And you can see the additional ones. You in 9A, should be planting them all. You want to get them in the ground about four to six weeks before your coldest period. Um, so that would be, I don't know if you actually get frost, um, but you, you, you will be able to grow a lot of spring flowers that you cannot grow by planting in spring because your heat comes. So you need to plant all cool flowers, you know, that six to eight weeks before your coldest period if you don't actually get frost. And Cindy... Oh, hi, Cindy. Good. I'm glad you're going to join us. Um, cone flowers are seeds. I do not think they're very easy to start from seeds, so I cannot help you with that. But I tell you who, um, 
my friend Miriam wrote the book. I'm trying to think the name of it. It was published at the same time as Cool Flowers is why I, she, Miriam Goldberg, she's a wild flower seed grower. And she has a book and it gives you all the tips on starting all those crazy hard to start seeds like cone flowers because some of them need to be stratified. Some of them need this, need that. Um, so it's not um, as easy as it sounds. So you need to get some help. Cindy, uh, questions on sunflowers. After cutting the flowers, when do you pull the stalk? Well, as soon as, I mean, immediately, as soon as possible, I do not pull anything or do anything besides cut flowers when I'm actually harvesting, but they can be pulled out right away. Um, and removing sunflower stalks is what keeps people from growing sunflowers. You have to find a way. That's why, um, yeah, I can't take, we're almost ready to be done. But I mean, before I had a tractor with a pull behind tiller, I always had a bush hog. But I had no way, even if I bush hogged the leftover stems, I had no way to get the stumps out um, because those suckers, even when you plant them close together, the stems get big. And you just can't. I even hired one year in an attempt. I thought, all right, I'll, I'll hire some young strapping teenage boy, you know, that thinks that, you know, it's on the wrestling team or something and wants to build muscles and let him. That would be his only job is to pull sunflower stumps. He didn't even last half a day. Um so mechanically is all we learned how to do it. And that is by bush hogging them to the ground, then tilling them under. Um, so get them out there as soon as you can, because those roots are amazing. Who was your East Coast irrigation? Barry, as in B-E-R-R-Y, Hill, H-I-L-L, irrigation. They're in Western Virginia. Um, and the best time. So here's the thing about irrigation people. A lot of them have tech help for the phone, but you better call them this winter. Once February comes and, and growers, established growers start ordering their stuff and they start getting busier than heck, they have the same help shortages everybody else does. You'll not get anybody on the phone. So you need to get on the ball, figure out what you have, what you think. I mean, they need to know how long your rows are going to be, how much water and it tells you on their website usually what information you need to know to figure out what you need. And then if you can't figure it out, you can call for tech help. Al Hollow, is it too late for your class? Yeah, my class registers one enrolls just once a year. Um, in when is it? The first of October. And um, yeah, so school starts November 1st. It's six weeks long. And um, then you're mine forever. You're in, you can be in my alumni Facebook group and um, pop in and out of there from time to time. And um, anyway, taming wildflowers. There you go, Jesse. So y'all, it is so great that our team member, our team has gotten to the point where they, I have people with me on these, whenever I'm talking to you guys, Jesse is, who is a flower farmer, um, is who is posting on behalf of the gardener's workshop this morning. And she looked it up, taming wildflowers by Miriam Goldberg. If you are interested in growing wildflowers, Miriam is your girl. And she, all right. So friends, we are going to um, wrap it up here. I want to say that we're expecting Cool Flowers, the book back in stock, hopefully by mid-November, um, December. I know that it's going to be sold out immediately. We have a wait list of people. If you need the book, you need to get on our wait list. What happens when you get on a wait list on our website or on our app? Um, and what that means is as soon as whatever it is comes back in stock, you get an email before everybody else really realizes it's back on the store. Um, and we do know there is um, that there's three times more people on the wait list than we have books that are coming. And then the publisher is not getting their big order until late December. So we won't be able to get more until then. So get on the wait list. That's how, you know, I never kind of understood how the, all that stuff works, but that's the joy of getting on a wait list is that means that you are going to hear and know about the opportunity, whether it's my course whether it's a book, whether it's a seed. I mean, people have been on the wait list for silver drop eucalyptus for a year and a half now. We're all just praying that Australia stops having fires for them and that there'll be silver drop 
flower seeds available someday again. Um, so get on the wait list. Um, and Al Hollow, yes, it would be for next year. You can get on the wait list um, and you can email, um, go to my website, gardenersworkshop.com, go to my page and get on my wait list and get on the our farm news email list. And that way you won't miss it when it opens next year. So yes, enrollment has closed for this year. Um, all right, friends, let's see what else we have here. So happy to hear it's going to be back in stock. Yeah, you know, the paper shortage really drove um, publishers to have to scramble of where to have books published. I mean, we've had Cool Flowers has been getting reprinted two to three times a year for the last two, three years. And um, he's had to find yet a whole nother printer. And so it's a real thing. And um, the supply chain issues is a reality, friends. It is not, um, it's not a, I'm sure there are people blowing it up and making it sound that way. But as someone that had, owns a retail store, I'm telling you, it's a real thing. Oh, and Jesse just put the wait list on here so you can get on our wait list for that. So friends, I'm glad you've joined me here today. And um, we may or may not take a pause for the month of November for seed start and Saturday, since I'm not really starting seeds. It'll just depend on what's going on and the big picture of things. School starts and I have a big project going on, but I will, we will keep you all posted. And again, if you're on our email news list, you newsletter list, you will not miss um, because I'm on Ask a Flower Farmer on Instagram on Wednesdays at 1230. Sometimes somebody else takes over some of our other instructors, but I'm on there. You know, Dave Dowling, who is like, oh my gosh, the encyclopedia he is, and Ellen Frost and um, Gretel Adams. If y'all did not watch, if you're even thinking about hoop houses, or greenhouse, you have got to connect with Steve and Gretel of Sunny Meadows. They have 18 structures. They're full-time flower farmers in Ohio. They were vegetable growers. Um, anyway, Gretel took over Ask a Flower Farmer, which you can watch here on YouTube or on Instagram. You can watch the replay. Their course opens in a couple of weeks. Y'all, you do know. I mean, so many people have said to us that the depth of information is of such, doesn't matter if you even have a house or not. There's so much flower growing information in there. Everybody will benefit. Um, but it is pest control, um, scheduling, how to maintain, where to place them, where to buy them. It is everything you would want to know. This is the core, their course, which is growing cut flowers in hoop and greenhouses. This is a course that you want to take before you buy a structure if you haven't already bought one. Um, and that course goes in open enrollment. I think it's like the third week in November. It's right before um, um, Thanksgiving. And they're like mine, only opens once a year. And I will tell you the really great news. If anybody has taken Gretel and Steve's course, you know that the depth of information is like the most overwhelming thing you've ever taken we are in the process now of time stamping their course. That means that the syllabus, which is the outline of their course, after the first of the year, this will be available to all the previous students as well as their new students. The course will be time stamped. That means if you say, oh my gosh, what did, what did they say about thrips? You'll be able to at a glance, look at this syllabus and say, oh, it's at 10 minutes and 20 seconds of session XYZ and go look at it. We know now that people reference these big courses more after school is over than during school. You know what I mean? It's like you watch it and try to take it in, but you can't. But as your business grows and develops and you grow, growing more and more, you need to go back to the course. It's like, what did they say about what happens when I do this or what, how do I harvest it or whatever? So Y'all, you just don't want to miss out. We are really all about bringing you the information. Um, our courses are um, mixed PowerPoint slideshows, which is a mix of videos um, and slides and handouts and a lot of talking, um, tons of information. It's like going to school. It is not um, 
it's not all entertainment, I guess is what I want to say. I just don't want anybody to go in there with that illusion. But anyway, Gretel, who um, did Instagram last week, I would highly encourage you to check that out. And their enrollment is the 19th through the 23rd. Thank you um, very much there. Can you say the name again? My internet went out. Oh, um, so Steve and Gretel's course, which is all on our website, go to the gardenersworkshop.com to online courses. It is growing cut flowers in hoop and greenhouses. And you can learn more about all that over at the gardenersworkshop.com. All right, friends, till we meet again, see you. Let's see. Today is Monday. No, today is, today is Saturday. Do you see why? We're not starting seeds today. Um, so I'll be on Instagram on Wednesday, 1230 time change. It used to be 1130. Now it's 1230 Eastern time for 30 minutes. I answer your questions. Bring them on, friends. All right, folks. Great questions today. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you, Jesse.